Hello, everybody. Let's restart the program. Good morning, buenos dias, buongiorno. Uh, what are the languages? Gondain. Uh, it might be uh, buonasera. When it, uh, what time is it in Italy? I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway, I welcome you all back to our room. To those of you who joined recently, welcome to our digital technology and strategy conference. My name is Jose Ramos. I'm program director here at ILP. And along with my colleague, Graham Rong, we welcome you here. We're very glad you're here in person. Um, so we have our next two presentations prior to lunch next door uh, are by Professor Marcus Bueller, followed by MIT Startup Exchange Lightning Talks. And you'll be able to meet startups during the lunch break as well. And don't forget about tomorrow's program. We cover quantum, uh, uh, we cover AI, drones, modeling, et cetera. And so now it's my great pleasure uh, to present to you Professor Marcus Bueller. He is a McAfee professor in the Department of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering, and his talk today will be about digital materials. Great, um, thank you. Um, and um, nice to see real, real people again when I give a talk, so that's um, exciting. And um, yeah, so I, I have, um, let me make sure I think everything works here. Okay, very good. Um, so, so this conference really is um, themed around something that's really close to my heart. Um, it is using computers to design materials, uh, make materials, and analyze them. And um, it's been a field, I think, that's been changing very rapidly, as, as you know. Uh, and what I'll do today really is go through a couple of different examples of how we um, solve advanced engineering problems using computers, AI, machine learning, deep learning, um, and advanced manufacturing techniques that really have been changing uh, very rapidly. As uh, Miriam uh, just told you a few minutes ago, I came in at the tail end of her presentation. I do teach a professional education course, and I um, put a focus in this course on a lot of the things I'll talk about today, materials modeling, really from the atomic scale to the structural scale, uh, deep learning, a big part in deep learning, machine learning, data sets and everything, as well as additive manufacturing. So this is a little bit of plug for that. And we're hoping to be, we're planning to be on campus at MIT next year again after two years of being live virtual. So hope to see some of you there. So what do I do? Well, I, um, I spend all my time thinking about atom to big scales. You know, I'm, I'm, I have a training in chemistry, material science, as well as engineering and mechanics. And I'm, I'm fascinated by this quest of understanding how we can predict material behavior at the macro level, where your products might be um, from the atomic scale of chemistry. And that's an immense sort of separation of scales, obviously. You go from scales of molecules, maybe a protein and a biological material, all the way to a structural scale of a, of a tower, a building, or a car, or a spaceship, or a space shuttle, or I think we have a space launch today, a very historic one, right? So these kinds of structures are exposed to extreme conditions, high temperatures, pressures, uh, stresses, and my, my quest is to understand how materials behave under extreme conditions and how to make materials lighter, um, more sustainable, uh, to make them from unusual sources. So think about building an airplane out of glass. Um, think about building an airplane out of waste. Um, and all of this is really enabled by, by nanotechnology. And uh, as you have heard from other, a couple other talks, I'm sure MIT is, is a leader in nanotechnology, nanoscience. We do a lot of work at the interface of the atomic level and things we can see and touch. And the other big part of what I do is computing, I mentioned already. And you see this on the slide here. We use a variety of different computational techniques. I won't bore you with the details here. But in a nutshell, we're, we're able to capture um, information from the atomic all the way to the structural scale. And we're able to integrate a lot of data. You can imagine there's a lot of data, a lot of information through deep learning uh, and computer vision and, and many different architectures. And I'll, I'll show you, hopefully, a couple of interesting examples today to introduce to this exciting field. Um, and so the other piece of this is nano, and the other one is the College of Computing, which you've heard about as well. So MIT is really at, the, at the, um, the nexus of some very exciting developments in understanding the physical world, not only through experimentation, but also modeling and simulation and, and using all the great data we have. So what do we do? Well, we are, we're interested in kind of pushing the, uh, the envelope um, in academia to, to think a little bit broader in how we understand the material. Right? So if you make a product today, 
um, you might, uh, not, obviously you're from many different industries, but let's say you are in the business of making coffee cups, which probably you aren't, but let's say you are. Um, you're gonna make the coffee cup and you make a certain color, a certain texture, um, and you sell it and that's it. So what I'm trying to think is, um, you know, what if you, the coffee cup would be like an iPhone? You know, it could update itself, it could respond, you know, it would respond to people dropping it, it would repair itself, and, and you see this beautiful picture of the spider here. Uh, and of course, many biological organisms, like the spider and its web, uh, or human body, is actually able to do that. We're not materials designed for, in a factory, or by a designer, by an engineer, but we're actually uh, designed, but we're also uh, continuously changing and adapting you know, at many different time scales, from evolutionary time scales, very long, to very short time scales of having a broken bone, right? Or having a cut in the skin and, and having, uh, stopping bleeding there. So there's really amazing things going on in biology, and that's why we study that. We're trying to figure out, can we kind of understand how spiders build these beautiful web structures um, from these molecules, right? And so this is what's sort of the, the amazing thing is, of course, when you think about proteins, if I were to quiz you, um, what's a protein? You probably think about additives or maybe drugs or maybe uh, supplements, diet supplements or, or meat potentially or whatever you, you think about proteins. But proteins really are the basis to all the materials in our body, all the organs, all the, 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 the motors, the engines that make our bodies work, the cells work, um, and also the spider webs. And they're kind of like Lego building blocks, right? So I think like an engineer or scientist, you think, well, these are kind of little building blocks made by this language of DNA um, and they're put together by self-organization, by a living organism from this kind of mess, right? So this is what happens when your kids play with Lego and they drop it and they, and kids perform this task sometimes in creating something amazing out of these Lego building blocks and you can assemble it. And, and that's kind of what the spider does, right? Um, as an example, um, this is a, a construction process of a web over a period of seven days and, and we, we're imaging this and, and st studying this and building computer models of this to understand how does the spider actually create such an in interesting structure, and I could probably spend five hours talking about spider webs, so I won't do that, but um, the, the structures are quite amazing, and, and what's amazing, of course, is that there's no construction plan, there's no G-code, right? There's no printing model. Um, the spider creates the web um, based on its neural network, capturing information, making decisions. The spider can repair the web, right? If there's um, a damage, um, you know, she'll go in and, and repair certain sections. The web had different functions, and so on, right? And so this is an example of a living system it's also a really interesting 3D printer, right? Um, this material is made from protein, and it's basically made from a fly, right? So the spider will basically repeat this process. We have a spider lab at MIT, and so if you come to MIT, now email me, I'll show you our spider lab. Um, spiders eat a fly, and they create this sort of mess of Lego building blocks. Uh, and a couple of days later, they have an amazing web, which is um, the, the individual filaments is as strong as steel. And so you kind of think about this. So it's a material that has a strength of steel, much higher toughness, it's extensible, um, it's an extremely efficient material. So if you think about sustainability, you're thinking about how do I make things not from steel or aluminum or carbon intensive technologies, how do I make concrete differently? Well, so look to nature and you have carbon sinks pretty much everywhere, right? And so this is a great example for this. Now, um, how do we sort of go from observation to predictions and decisions and design, and this is where computation comes in. We build models of the web structure. So you see on the left is the real web. We, we digitize the web, build a graph model. So now we can use the power of mathematics and deep learning, machine learning, having a lot of data. Um, and we can transform this into uh, 3D printed materials. We can kind of take the data and create something totally different that's inspired by the spider web, but looks very different, it's an architected material, right? So these are materials that are very efficient in dissipating energy, very lightweight, but very stiff, right? So, so the, the sky's the limit kind of when you go to nature, look at nature, and this does not just happen at the structural scale that you can see, but also happens at the molecular scale, as I, as I talked about. So this is what we do. Um, and it's you know, an incredibly um, exciting time for us. For, for many years, we were kind of stuck. You know, we had this biology paradigm where, okay, we have DNA, we have proteins, um, we have this immense amount of data. Um, we understand all sorts of genes and genomes of different organisms, and um, we, we know they're Lego building blocks, and they make the proteins, but we didn't really know how to connect the two, right? This language that nature speaks is very complex. We as engineers can't really understand how to design something that we want. You know, we, we can copy maybe something in nature, but we don't want to just copy a spider web. We want to make something that behaves for an application that we're interested in, packaging, maybe a coffee mug, whatever your product might be. Um, and so this is where machine learning and computation broadly, but especially deep learning, has 
really revolutionized the field, and it's um, you know, an incredibly exciting moment for us here, where we can kind of really look to nature as another example, our conch shells, which are basically things grown in the ocean out of silica, out of sand, um, very, very tough materials, very tough ceramics. If you want to speak the engineering language, it's, it's a very tough ceramic. Um, and we can mimic them using 3D printing and create architected materials, you see on the right-hand side, what we can make, you know, designed by computers and mimicking them out of biomass in this particular example. And so we use waste product. And this is actually some work that was initiated through um, the MIT Energy Initiative and with the help of ILP uh, company in Spain that sponsored this work. So we've really been able to kind of use really unusual sources. This was sewage sludge at that, in that example. Stuff you wouldn't even want to touch, but now we're making in the functional materials. So why do we do that? Well, um, and, I'm, um, and I want to just tell you, I, I have probably more slides than I have time, so I will probably end at some point when 20 minutes up and <laughs> have time for questions. But um, I, you know, one of the things we, we do a lot of times is we're interested in fracture. Um, and how many, how many of you study fracture in their business? Or probably you should, because, um, you, or you might actually study it. Maybe you don't know about it. But pretty much anything you build um, and you sell uh, it's going to have to have some mechanical performance, right? So even if you make, you know, a coffee cup, it's maybe you think about the design, but you want to be very tough. Or if you make uh, an iPhone, a chip, you know, the chip has to actually uh, sustain mechanical loading, thermal loading, and we're dealing with high stresses, and you want things to be resilient against deformation. Otherwise, you have to replace them a lot of times. Potholes in the street, I mean, you, the list goes on and on. So we study fracture, and we're interested in kind of thinking about how do we make materials tougher and lighter and stronger but using less material, right? And so what you see in this example is an architected material that, uh, sorry, I'm switching between the two screens, but um, that essentially has a built-in architecture at the meso scale or micro scale all the way down to the nano scale that prevents this material from breaking very easily. So if you don't have the structure, the material is very easy to break, like glass. If you add the internal structure inspired by nature, designed by computational algorithms, materials become virtually unbreakable, right? And so in the, in, if you, I could pass this around, actually, and it's, it's essentially, you can't break it. So it's quite amazing. And this comes through the internal structure. You know, why, how does it work? Um, we always like to, at MIT, we, we kind of like to give you not only the, 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 the nugget of the result, but also I want to try to explain to you a little bit how this works mechanistically. And I think it's very easy to understand. If you, if you look at the, the top thing here, that's a material like glass, let's say, without internal structure. And if you, uh, what we're plotting here is the stress field inside the material around a defect, like a little crack or a little imperfection that is always there. And if you, um, if you load it, like thermal loading, or you drop something, or it's just exposed to mechanical loading during operation, um, you're going to see a concentration of stress as a singularity at the tip of the crack. And so you can imagine, right, if, you, if uh, there are atomic bonds there, right, um, they're going to very easily snap. The material is going to break. It's very unstable. On the bottom, you see a material has internal structure. And so the trick really is by adding the internal structure and by doing it in the right way, right, you can actually distribute the loading, um, the forces, in a much larger area and, and basically prevent fracturing from occurring. And if fracturing occurs, you kind of make it on a local level. You don't break the entire structure. So that's sort of in a nutshell what, what composite design is about. Um, and the, the idea in, in nature is, is uh, universal. And you can actually create material designs that uh, span many different um, time and length scales in the operation. So um, I mentioned, you know, we're trying to think about materials that are kind of living, that can respond. And uh, what I'm trying to show here is um, sort of how um, biological materials are, are responsive. They have a, a brain a lot of times because we have a spider, we have a human, we build things, we see things, we touch things, we have a feedback mechanism, um, and we can mimic this now using AI. Right? And so this is really the exciting thing here that we can not only design a material, we've done this for many decades actually as engineers, uh, we can actually um, build in the intelligence in the material by adding a neural network model inside the material. And that sort of mimics what spiders do and what we do as a human organism. And that's sort of the framework of what we do. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how this can be applied. Um, and and the, you know, the, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that when you, when you want to design materials from this you know, atomic scale upwards, you're dealing with an in, immense computational uh, task, right? Because you have a lot of atoms in the material, you know, billions, trillions of atoms. And even the fastest computers really aren't able to really capture these atomic motions. 
in a, in a very big scale, right? Um, so we need to think differently. And this is where we uh, really began to look into deep learning a couple of years ago, and it has fundamentally changed the way we think about modeling. And I think at MIT, you're gonna see that being sort of the, the, the tip of the iceberg, um, and it will, of course, go everywhere um, you know, in, in the world, in, in companies, in design, in analysis, um, you know, beyond analyzing clicks on Facebook or advertisements. We're not talking about building computer models that have never seen an equation. Right? You know, the traditional way of building computer models is you, you write down an equation. An engineer writes down the equation, and uh, she's going to code the equation and, and write a final element code, and somebody's going to run it. And that's changing. Right? So now we have computer models that can actually capture information directly from observation. Um, it's kind of scary, right, if you think about engineers, but, but of course, the, um, the engineer is still going to have jobs and work to do. Um, and it's going to transition into analyzing data, understanding data, talking about data science, make predictions. So this is what we do. You know, we're trying to converge, uh, think of differently about how engineers should be educated, um, what they're going to do in the future, and how we can apply these really exciting techniques. So well, what is this? Um, so deep learning can essentially be a different, totally different way of modeling materials. And the advantage is that we can model things, um, behaviors, with atomically sharp precision that we wouldn't even dream of doing just a couple of years ago. Right now we can do them using deep learning, and we can do them very quickly. And the sources of data uh, can be from anywhere. And that's the exciting thing that I work a lot with industry, and, and a lot of industry uh, partners have a lot of data, images, uh, consumer data, failure data. As you can tell, I'm fascinated with failure, so I'm, 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 I'm looking at failure all the time, but uh, you have maybe relationships between a microstructure and a failure pattern and you don't know what to do with this data. Right? So we figure out what to do with that mechanistically and understand actually how to mine the data. And this is where the right-hand side comes in. So long story short, on the left-hand side is sort of our in initial attempts uh, going back almost 10 years to describe materials using a process called metriomics, um, which captures these complex hierarchical relationships between structure and function. Um, we have done mathematics on this. Um, and now we're able to do very complex problems using deep learning and computation. And solving problems like this, you've seen this a few slides ago where I talked about the, the design of a composite structure, you know, adding the internal architecture, preventing fracturing. That's sort of the, the secret or the key behind that. Um, and we can capture these relationships using deep learning. And so the problem becomes a game, actually. And the game is the following, you know, in traditional ways, you, you kind of, as a designer um, of a material, and this could be a, a composite, it could be a, um, a sequence of DNA, it could be pretty much anything that you might be interested in designing. But the, the problem is you have a lot of combinations, and if you want to go through all these combinations, you know, it might take you years, billions of years to actually do that, right, brute force. And so what deep learning can do, it can understand patterns. And so you translate this game of finding the optimal pattern for a mechanical application or thermal application or biological application, uh, into something that is um, a tractable machine learning, deep learning problem. And there's you know, various ways to do that. Um, and you can replace in, in this approach now the conventional way of solving kind of like the brute force approach by, like I said, inventing the equation, writing down the equation, and sort of um, solving the equation by this, by this machine learning model. Okay. Okay. And when you, when you do that, um, you can very quickly come up with solutions. So for example, you can come up with um, optimal distributions of materials. In this case, you see um, a distribution of holes in graphene to create a very strong and tough material. Um, you can make 3D printed composites, which are shown here, um, which use multi-scale architecturing to create very strong and tough materials. Um, we can also make materials that are designed um, based on words. And so when you think about engineers, um, the equations, we actually have sort of pushed this in, in even different directions to say, um, we don't even want to communicate with a computer using numbers or equations. Let's see if we can actually communicate with our own human language. Right? And so we have a, a model, a developed a model that we just published a few, um, a few days ago, actually came out, where we can use human text cues to design materials. And so this is sort of the world where you can imagine now speaking to a computer, and unlike Siri, which just gives you an answer, or Google, or, or was it Alexa, um, here the computer will actually 3D print a material for you. That's the vision where we're trying to go towards. 
um, by interacting with it. And so it's really a fundamentally different way of designing things. Um, and in this example here, um, you kind of see how uh, we've designed a mechanism using this process. Um, this is sort of a, a grip mechanism, which is, you can see, a very complex architecture that the algorithm has come up with based on human words. So I think this is the first material that's been kind of created based on thought. Right? So imagine, um, people have always thought, um, is thought a material? Right? And it's a philosophical question. Um, and, and here we've shown thought can actually become material using deep learning. Right? And so those are some of the cutting edge techniques. So if you're familiar with this field, um, what we're using here are transformer neural networks, which are um, very exciting developments in, in natural language processing that allow you to actually capture very long range relationships in, 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 in spoken language. And this also um, is, is possible, of course, now to understand in terms of the design of a, of a material. So, um, you know, shifting gears a little bit. So what else are you um, able to do with this? Well, you can kind of look at a material design problem. Um, you can also think about um, predicting how materials might break, right? And so I mentioned earlier, I, I'm fascinated by, by breaking stuff. And typically when we think about failure, we, we think about these failure mechanisms at different scales. Um, like this is an example of an earthquake. Um, all the way down to the atomic scale where the quantum mechanics um, really you know, controls or rules the, me the mechanistic interactions between atoms. And this kind of problem, you can solve this using molecular dynamics, right? So even though those are also cutting edge techniques, but they um, sort of take very long computationally. They might take um, days, weeks, months, or years to solve. And we can then simulate atom by atom. So we thought, you know, can we uh, simplify this process and, and actually um, you know, use AI methods to predict how things break directly from the microstructural information. And this is a game changer because unlike a molecular simulation or fine element simulation, of course, this kind of simulation can be done within just a few microseconds, right? And so when you think about design and optimizing, you know, again, you can do this very, very quickly. So this has been a game changer. So the way we do this, um, again, I'm, I'm trying to just go through an overview if you want to have more in-depth information, please email me. I'm happy to discuss with you uh, individually as well. But um, we, we, we train the computer model to understand how fracture works. We basically let it observe from the data how um, the equations of motions for cracks, for example, um, work out in practice. And the model never sees an equation, like I said in the beginning. Right? So the equations are kind of out of the way. Um, but we feed the model information based on images, which you see here. Okay. Um, and, and so the model basically has sort of two uh, important features to them. Um, one of them are convolutions, which are basically neural networks that are able to capture images and relationships between images. And the other one is, an, is a neural network that has information or capacity to learn time series and events in, sequ in succession, which is important for phenomena like fracture. And so combined, they allow us to predict fracturing. Um, we can actually use this method to very effectively um, predict how cracks propagate under different microstructures. So if you're a designer of a ceramic, you know, or a metal, you know that the orientation of cracks and the grain boundaries have a huge impact on how the material performs. And these methods allow us to, to, uh, to understand that and predict that and it agrees very well with the ground truth, which is basically a molecular model or an observation and experiment. Uh, we can do really fun stuff like this, you know, look at grain boundaries or gradients in a material. And so again, um, the, the difference to conventional methods is that these simulations can be run very, very quickly within just you know, a couple of, you know, a fraction of a second or less. Um, we can predict phenomena that have not been trained for. Right? And so that's something that I, I'm, I'm very passionate about is to see you know, how predictive are these models. Because of course, everyone can do deep learning. Everyone does it. But how far can you push the model to discover phenomena right, that we haven't seen yet? Uh, the model hasn't seen yet, or even patterns that we haven't really figured out yet, I talked about in the introduction. And so, so that's sort of what we do. We, we, we're trying to use the models to see, can we discover things we haven't, we haven't trained for, um, things we have not seen, not observed? Are there particular type of patterns that uh, we can utilize in design that we haven't really um, seen otherwise? And it's sort of a, if I get to the end, which probably I won't, but um, I, I have a great plot that shows you uh, the design of a protein, and there are millions of different combinations, and it's um, possible for the first time to see that with your own human eyes um, using machine learning. And when I first saw the plot, I, I kind of I, I couldn't get my head around it, and I could never unsee it because so far we only have seen, you know, three data points, four data points. Now I've seen a million data points, and I've seen where the truth lies in this whole spectrum of what I can achieve. And uh, and that's only possible using deep learning. Right? So we can design materials that have certain fracture paths. So if you're 
perhaps in the industry of creating armors. I've worked with the DoD a lot, um, and so they're interested in understanding how to make materials that under ballistic impact are, are not gonna fail randomly, they fail in a very particular pattern, dissipate the most energy at the least weight. And so these are the kind of things we can design. Um, we can also predict um, stress and strain fields. So this is sort of the next level of this model, which um, actually was developed based on game theory. Um, so combining uh, game theory with deep learning and actually having multiple neural networks playing literally a game with each other. And now we can do um, even more sophisticated things like predicting uh, stress and strain fields, which currently is only possible using Van Allen models or molecular modeling. And again, very slow. You, for those of you in that field, uh, it's very slow. Here, we basically take an image of a microstructure uh, and immediately we get a prediction of a stress and strain field. So this is sort of the, the, uh, the, the, this field. And, and this, again, as I said earlier, we're only scratching the tip of the iceberg what's possible here. Um, it's fundamentally changing the way we model. Um, I want to mention also, it doesn't mean we're getting rid of all the existing models or the existing teams or the existing expertise, not at all. I mean, we're going to keep that. Um, but we have an entirely new window, an entirely new set of tools we can utilize to complement. Uh, those of you who like graphs, this is a comparison between um, a very good numerical model and the machine learning model. And so you can get some very, very good accuracies if you're quantitatively interested in predicting these, these kind of phenomena. So, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit to this here. Um, one of the other things we do is um, we work a lot with images. And the reason is that images are powerful because we, all of us have a lot of images. Um, you might have a lot of images from your products, from your customers, from micrographs. Um, and so images or slices of volumes and so forth are really terrific to work with. But a lot of us also have graph data. And another really exciting field right now are, is something called graph neural nets. Um, so these are essentially representations where pixels aren't pixels, so they're points, and they're connected. Um, and they can be connected in many different ways. So if you think about an atomic structure, this is a, a model that can predict stresses in an atomic lattice, um, where the lattice isn't a regular lattice, like a pixel. It could be any kind of organization. It could be a protein. Um, in this case, it's a polycrystalline graphene structure, so a very complex microstructure with a lot of different chemical interactions and bondings. And graph models allow us to capture stress and strain fields. So this is the ground truth based on a, a very high level atomistic simulation and then the right-hand side is prediction using the model. So uh, you can tell um, just visually that this model is very, very accurate. A lot of other things we can do. Um, you know, we can kind of think about inspiration from nature as I, as I led into from the, in the beginning. Um, you know, to think that materials could be inspired by spider webs. I didn't really talk too much about this by, by architecture found in seashells. Um, but there are many other things, many other phenomena in nature. Um, fire is one we've used recently to make materials from. Um, and maybe I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, we've made materials from music and sound. Uh, we've looked at, um, you know, leaves. And actually, I have a similar picture they had up on the, on the screen here, the foliage. As you think about the foliage, you know, what can you take out of that and use deep learning to design architected materials from that process and, and so on. This is a material made from spider webs on the right hand side, so I won't go into detail what that is, but, but you can kind of see that we can create some really complex architectures. We can manufacture them using 3D printing. Um, we can make materials from um, uh, tracking data of animals. And you know, why does that matter? Well, a tracking data of animals has um, information about patterns yet at a, yet another level. And so this information could be transformed using deep learning into materials design. So we can actually make some really interesting materials. This is a material based on, uh, made, made from fire. Um, uh, here, materials made from fire into airfoils for airplanes. So you can see that uh, there's some incredible um, sort of opportunities here in converting data across manifestations um, that you haven't thought about probably, right? You haven't thought before you came today that you can make a, an airfoil from fire. Maybe you have, but maybe you haven't. Probably not, right? But I haven't thought about it either, but one of my students came up with that. And, and, and so, so these are some really interesting new directions that are beyond sort of the human imagination very clearly. These are leaves, right? So you can look at leaves. This is a picture I mentioned was up earlier. Um, and and if, you, if you look at the internal structure of leaves, um, they have some, and as well known, they have um, kind of a, a plywood um, or uh, um, some sort of um, pattern structure kind of shown here. And the question is, how do we use this? So if you want to make something out of that that's not like a leaf, but actually is maybe made from a metal or maybe from a ceramic, we can use deep learning to do that. And, and so what you see here are actually slices that we're reconstructing into a three-dimensional volume in an architecture 
um, in space, which then can be 3D printed, manufactured, um, and, and constructed into these incredible materials. These are a lot of them are foam-like materials, application being very stiff, very lightweight, um, made from very inexpensive materials like biomass based for the inks um, and creating sort of very unusual sourcing of material. And the architecture allows us to overcome the intrinsic limitation of these, of these materials in there. So, so kind of like this is what you see what's inside this material. You can't see it because you can't really look inside even though um, we printed it from uh, transparent material but it's hard to look inside. But if you take slices, kind of like you see what's inside, um, you can layer them. You know, you can think about new types of plywood applications. Uh, you can make filters out of this. In some other work, we've made filters um, from silk, you know, inspired by geometries like these. So the sky's the limit, you know, what you can do. Uh, with this, uh, these are some impact deformations. I mentioned a lot of these materials are kind of play with the idea of creating um, architecture to um, induce large deformation, uh, but controlled deformation, so things don't buckle. Buckling is a phenomenon that engineers don't like usually, right, because um, it's catastrophic, like failure, and so here we have been able to modulate the architecture um, ever so slightly um, to actually induce controlled buckling in this, and so all of these ideas can be inspired from that. Um, I'm, I'm almost out of time. Maybe I'll, I'll just show a few slides um, on, on the protein work, and then I, I'll stop for a discussion, but um, another really big part of my lab deals with proteins at the molecular level. Um, I, I, you know, I'm interested in that connection now all the way down to the genetic level. You, know, you think about the, the genetic information that makes up a protein, how it assembles, um, and how it folds. And yes, there's another area where deep learning has made tremendous advances. We have a, a large project with IBM on, on creating food security applications um, um, from these proteins. Um, we have you know, thought about how to model proteins in its innate language, right? And so you think about proteins and molecules are, are really vibrating objects. And if you, if you use the human brain, a lot of times we are very biased in how we approach problems because we look at the macroscopic world and we think, okay, if I want to make a model of a protein, I'm going to draw it like a table or like a building. But actually at the nanoscale, we have the duality between waves and particles and so on and so on. You know, the quantum laws are weird and different. So we thought, can we build models of uh, molecules that are based on this vibrational pattern? And, and actually, of course, that intersects very nicely with what spiders and insects do. You know, they, they, they live in the world of vibrations. They don't have good eyes, they kind of see uh, through hearing, and, and of course we also have that in our own imagination. We have music, we have strings, we have pressure waves that we recognize as, as sound and language. Um, and of course this relationship between vibrations and, and information, uh, and how information is captured and how it functions is something that's um, you know, very deeply connected to my work. I have done a recent study um, on, the, on COVID, which um, actually elucidated some, some you know, really incredible finding in that um, the different COVID you know, species, if you wish, or variants um, or types of COVID uh, coronavirus diseases can be understood and predicted actually in terms of lethality and infectiousness based on the vibrational pattern. And so this has some really interesting insights that allowed us to predict um, you know, how different types of coronaviruses, including variants, I don't have this in the slide, the paper's in review right now, we can predict how lethal and infectious the new variants might be based on these vibrational patterns. So you can see that you know, there's you know, incredible applications out there. And, and I would say the, the takeaway from this is that the key to making this happen is to, to think differently and that computers teach us um, something about how information is stored in unconventional ways, in this case, in vibrational patterns. And of course, we have music made by humans. Again, um, patterns made from a totally different perspective. We found that these, um, actually, musical information, musical scores can be, can be understood, actually, um, as a platform to design materials. And so what you hear in the background is music, but this music can actually be utilized and transformed into material by basically taking the vibrations in a musical piece and, and translating it back through deep learning into this code, how to construct a material. Right? And so this sounds uh, really weird, but it's, it's actually possible. Um, and we can kind of do this um, you know, forth and back and have sort of translated musical pieces into materials with translated materials into music as well. But, but the, the design perspective was, I think the most exciting thing is actually using kind of um, you know, sound as a way of extracting material design from that. And we've made it in the lab. So you can kind of, if you come to my lab, I'll show it to you. Uh, you can touch a material that we've made from sound, which was, again, is, is, is using information that's unusual. Um, what do we apply this to? We apply this kind of thinking to very application. This is one um, with my colleague, Benedetto Mavelli. Um, this is also funded by IBM. 
on um, creating uh, coatings around food. Right? So we're really trying to figure out how do we make antimicrobial coatings. And so again, you have the idea of antimicrobial properties are abundant in nature, actually including in silk found in honeybees. But we don't want to have honeybees around our fruit in the supermarket. So how do we take that information and make it into something we can actually really put around our food that's edible and has the right predictability in terms of mechanical stability. Um, and so this is what this project's about. So, so this protein world is, as I mentioned in the very beginning, isn't just um, you know, proteins as a drug or protein as a supplement. Um, it's really proteins as materials. And, and here's um, some of the deep learning for folding. Um, that's been a, a game changer. I mean, we barely sleep because we have so many things we work on. Um, you know, pr protein folding has been an unsolved problem for, for you know, dec ever since protein were, proteins were actually discovered or un understood. Um, and now we can actually, for the first time, access pretty much any protein in 3D geometry. So, so this is sort of what's happening right now. We can use deep learning to not only predict how proteins fold, but also how they function. And sort of the, this has been mind blowing. This actually, so I did get to the end. So thanks for being patient. Nobody's stopping me. So I'll just have a few more slides. But um, this, these are the plots I mentioned that you can never unsee. So what you see here uh, are, are kind of a sequence mutation. So this is what happens in evolution where you have nature exploring a lot of different potential sequences to see which one's suitable for a task. And you know, when you go in here and you want to make a protein, each point is a protein. There are thousands and millions of these here. Um, if you're an engineer making a protein in a lab, it's going to take you weeks, months, maybe longer, cost a lot of money to make it. If you do computation conventionally, it takes you also weeks, years, potentially to do that. With deep learning, we've been able to do this, create this kind of a plot on a laptop within you know, half an hour. And this is the thing that I, I can never unsee that anymore because before I had basically three or four points after a year. Now I have millions. And I can actually understand how the relationship looks like. In this case, we have a banana curve. We call it banana curve. Um, and you know, kind of see, OK, here are some interesting designs. Um, can we mine that data now right, and understand which are the ones that are really promising for applications? And um, this is what I will end with. I, um, you know, we, we are, I think we're in a time of some major changes um, in, in how we understand the world around us and how we can influence it, and also in what we can use to build stuff. I mean, we're no longer limited to steel and cement and concrete and all those things, and petroleum. We're actually beginning to see that, um, like in a spider, we can basically one day maybe take, take waste or take flies or grow biomass and you know, have a carbon sink you know, um, and make it into pretty much any material we want, um, and the key is that puzzle that we talked about during this, during this talk is the integration of information, how matter is assembled, um, and this can be done, I think, only using computers. Now, the only thing we have to do is make computers more efficient, energy efficient, right? That's the, the dirty little secret, that computers take a lot of energy. But um, maybe someone else will figure that out. OK. Right, with that being said, um, um, thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to uh, answer some, some questions. And thanks for giving me a few more minutes to, to go over this. Oh, the questions, OK. Um, which one should I pick? OK, let me see. Is the spider web structured? Um, so yes. And, and actually, that's the interesting thing that you, when you look to nature, um, you know, it's something like a spider web, I think, is a great example, or language, or anything, really. A lot of times there's, there's hidden information in there. Um, and and the, in a spider web, it's very, I, don't, I can't pull it up because I would have to go through 100 slides or so. But um, I have a movie that shows that, actually. And, and you can see as you go through the spider web in virtual reality, we have a VR application where you can put up your glasses. And you can actually spend hours exploring the web. Um, because the webs, the filaments are so small, you can, you can literally spend hours in there. Um, I don't recommend it. But uh, well, maybe you can actually, and you can even hear this, the spider web because we we actually um, we actually make the uh, vibrations of the web audible to your ears as well. So lo long story short, um, you know when you when you do that, um, you're going to see as you fly through the web, you're going to see regions that look like a lattice, very organized. You're going to see regions that look very disorganized. You see some regions that are not, almost not connected. You see islands, um, and so yeah, so there are structures in there. There are the areas, and so the key for us as engineers then, if we put the engineering hat on is um, how do we mine that data? You know, so like I showed um, you know, in the leaf example, we have techniques now where we can say, um, I need a material that has you know, some of the incredible low density of spider webs, 
um, but I want to focus on, the, on an area that's really highly organized. And I want to make this not into a spider web, because who wants to build spider webs? Probably nobody, unless you work in a zoo, maybe. Um, but, but let's say you work in the, um, in the industry where you need something as a packaging material or coding, or you want to have a texture. And you want to see, I, want to, I like this area. I think it has some really interesting properties. You know, create something that fits around my laptop here, or fits around my cell phone, or creates a coding or a certain shape. And, that's what deep learning can then do. So that's kind of like how we think about the problem. Um, and there's not only the, the geometry, of course, it's the functional aspect, right? Like tactile responses and the density and optical properties. And I, and I have some great colleagues, you know, of course, at MIT that, that focus maybe on those questions. We have, um, you know, a very collaborative environment here. So, so there are many things you can kind of engineer into the material beyond what it's initially intended for. Right? So the leaves, a great example, I, uh, we started um, this, you know, last spring and, the question was kind of like, yeah, if you take these, this beautiful foliage, you can see this here, um, you know, what kind of materials can you build from that? Um, and it's not obvious, but you can, you can mine that data. Um, oh, next question. Sorry, I, I keep answering the same one forever. Um, but um, what startups leading? Um, well, so I, I, I don't have a good answer to this. Um, maybe I should have one, but I, I don't have a good one, what the companies are. But, but I would say, you know, there's different dimensions. One of them, of course, there are, there are 3D printing um, activities, obviously, um, and I think this area, I, I think I, I've observed that space, and um, there, there's a big divide between, uh, um, the, I wouldn't say dinosaurs, but basically the, the way we've been doing modeling for 40 years since computers became modeling tools. Um, and you know the likes of the basically the the, the legacy codes from modeling simulation, the CAE models and CFD, um, and then there's the new world where we're as you've seen in a lot of examples where we kind of think about geometry totally differently. We're, we're liberated from um, you know sharp edges, lattices, equations. We kind of really think much more about functional spaces, and we have an engineering. We're not just designers. We actually know this design leads to toughness and so forth. Um, and so there's a really big divide, I think, in, in there, and there's a, a clear opportunity. Um, and there are some startups that go in the space where they, they think about geometry differently and optimization differently, and I have had some really great discussions, actually, recently with a bunch of startups in the space. So I think that's a good area. Um, and because it's not just about printing, it's also how do you get what to print right into that, into that printer. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a great opportunity, yeah. Okay, so I think, any other questions or? Oh, here, okay. Yeah, I think biomass is something that probably is undervalued today. I mean, you've got a lot of people thinking about um, you know, biomass as a waste, and you have the sort of low value um, um, facility around that. You're trying to valorize maybe biomass in, um, um, as, you know, as packaging or, or maybe a material you're gonna throw away. Or, but I think there's an opportunity to think more deeply about how biomass actually looks like at the atomic scale. So when you, when you go all the way down to the atomic scale, waste doesn't smell bad, okay? And, bi and biomass doesn't, doesn't look just like, like some mass. You know, it's actually molecules. And, and if you're um, a um, nano engineer, um, you, you're gonna love what you see because you see in biomass an extreme diversity and richness of, um, of chemical building blocks. So if you're like the kid in a, in a Lego shop, right, I mean, you're gonna see all the all imaginable Lego pieces in there that actually, if you're in a conventional engineering field where you buy your products in, in raw and pure form from your supplier, you're not gonna have this diversity of, of building blocks and, and you actually have to manually engineer it. So, so in biomass, you have it in there. And, and I think that for, you know, for us, we, we, we see that uh, and we also see the challenges, of course. You have to sort them. You have to rearrange them. Um, but if you can do that, and that's where nano comes in, um, and if you have this, these big data tools, um, uh, suddenly you, you see you can actually make products that don't, look like waste anymore or biomass, an unvalued uh, product that only has a small valorization uh, potential. So now you have a capacity to create some high-tech products basically from that. So that's how I would look at this problem. Um, and and I, I, th I am very 
excited about this in particular because biomass is um, you know, something that we, we have in abundance. Um, nobody wants to work with it. Um, and, and most engineering has been, I would say, very empirical. So basically people just um, mix in something, they bake it, they heat it, and, um, and trial and error, basically. Whereas we think that if you develop a molecular model of the structure, if you yeah, solve that puzzle, you know, um, you treat it like, a, like DNA, basically. Right? So you know, we have a lot of power in, in biology and medicine, uh, precision medicine that really is around mining data and humans and making it into um, you know, actionable items and medicines and diseases, treatments, and so on. Um, and so we're going to apply this machinery now that's available now uh, to biomass, that could be that could be a good good potential. Um, there was one more question I didn't see. I don't know if it, it went away, but I don't know if you can pull it up again or. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I can pick. That's great. Usually they don't, I can't pick. Usually they ask me, and then I have to answer. But um, oh yeah, so oh sorry, no, I'm I'm reading it here. Um, of course, you don't see the questions. Oh, here's on the side, yeah. Um, so the question is um, the, the temperature effect. No, I actually had one of my colleagues, um, Fatih Al-Tahir, he, he asked me that same question uh, when we started doing this work on COVID, and I, I, I don't quite have a good answer yet, but basically he asked um, how are seasons going to affect the, the virus and reproducibility and so on. And, and of course, there's, there's an effect, um, and we, just, we haven't studied it. We've been focusing a little bit more on, um, on, the, on the mechanisms and mutations and also on treatment options with Lincoln Labs. We've been working on some ideas there. Um, but yeah, um, clearly when you, when you think about a virus like COVID as not just um, you know, something that has a genetic sequence, but actually something, it's like a mechanical object. And when it interacts with your body, it will bind to your body mechanically. It will connect like a puzzle, lock and key. You know, you've, all, you've all seen the animations, but um, What's missing in these animations are the vibrations. The structures aren't actually, they're continuously changing their shape and stuff. But, um, and so, yeah, once you take a, that picture and you treat the virus as a material, um, you, you're going to have an entirely new spectrum of, of understanding this, including, you know, effective temperatures and so forth, absolutely. So, so that, that's a big deal, I think. Um, and it sort of speaks to the fact that we, we're, you know, want to broaden a little bit the horizon of how we look at things. That's what my lab is trying to do. Um, and that of, it happens all the time at MIT, um, and if you've seen this, it's an amazing place for this. We, we try to look at problems in an unconventional way, and we find unconventional solutions, which sometimes they don't work, and sometimes they work, but um, th that's another example like this, sort of treating COVID like a material. As another thing, probably haven't heard, people think about this as a virus, well, you can't see, but what if you treat it as a material, right, and you want to you understand its material properties, and like the question is great, and asking about how temperature might affect that. Okay, so um, thank you very much um, for being patient, um, and I hope to see you um, at MIT. Please stop by. I'm in building one, room 165. So, <laughs> thank you.